Okay, let's get started. We only have 25 minutes or so to go through this presentation. Uh, this was originally designed to be a 45 minute or 90 minute tutorial. And so we had to cut out a lot of material and we have to go really, really quickly. So I won't waste too much time. I'm James Powell. This is me on uh, Twitter. Um, recently I was thinking of uh, starting like a YouTube channel, but the one thing that really popular people on YouTube do is at the end of every video, they do that thing where they're like, please like, subscribe, bell, <laughs> comment. And I just simply can't motivate myself to mimic how enthusiastic they are about getting people to follow them. So follow me on Twitter or don't. I, I don't really care one way or the other. But if you want to, here, here you go. So this talk is called uh, a Get Client from Scratch. We're at Pi Gotham. Uh, today is. Um, Saturday, October 6, 2018, and I'm James Powell. So in this talk, what we're going to do is we're going to build a very, very, very simple Git client. Now, the motivation for this talk is we want to understand a little bit more about how Git works internally. We want to understand the data model. And the reason we want to understand the data model is we know that Git has a pretty poor UI, and it exposes a lot of the details of how it works internally. So it's very difficult for us to really become experts at Git unless we understand how things work under the covers. That's just a consequence of how poor the Git UI is. It exposes a lot of the details. Now, in 25 minutes, we can't go over everything. But what I can show you is I can show you a little bit about the core object model. I'm certain all of you at some point have heard somebody say, oh, Git is an immutable, content addressable storage for data. What the heck does that mean? Well, we'll write a little piece of code, and we'll see what that means more specifically. And we'll get an understanding a little bit more of how Git works. And if you'd like to take what I've started here, and you'd like to implement a full Git client, so a separated init, commit, uh, push, and a pull, I would really encourage you to do that. Maybe I'll post some of this code on GitHub so you have a starting point. And if you'd like to, you could tweet your uh, results to me because that's called engagement. That's what you got to do if you want to be popular on uh, Twitter. So I'm going to take a seat, because I'm going to live code this whole thing. Now, I said this is Git from scratch. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use nothing outside of the Python standard library, because it would be really cheap if I just uh, you know, showed you PyGit or LibGit2 or something like that. So we'll try and write as much of this from scratch as we can. Now, unfortunately, we have about 170 lines of code to write. The industry standard is uh, one developer in an eight-hour day can write about 100 lines of code. That's the number that people have been throwing around for the last 30 or 40 years. I don't think I can write 100 lines of code in 25 minutes, but we can probably do the best job that we can. So I'll show you where we're starting. Where we're going to start is a simple Git repository. So let's just create a Git repository here, and let's see what, what's in this repository. Well, there's really no files in here. There's just a simple file, a readme there. And uh, the readme itself is empty. And we know there's this .git directory here. And if we look at the contents of that .git directory, we can see there's a bunch of stuff in here. And honestly, we don't care about a lot of this stuff, especially not for this talk. All this hook stuff we don't care about. And this config, I'm sure you've looked at that. And there's a reason why in the info exclude, you put certain things that you don't put into your .git ignore file. We don't have time to go over that. The only thing we can really focus on is this file here that's called index. Uh, this file here, or this directory here that's called refs. Uh, the file at the top here, that's called head, and we won't really spend that much time on it. But most importantly, what's in this directory here? And that's kind of weird. I mean, these, all these files have really weird file names. And if we try and look at the contents of one of these files, we'll see it's really difficult for us to understand what the heck this thing is. It looks like a bunch of gibberish. But if we apply a little bit of investigative uh, pro uh, technique, we can try and figure out what this is. So we can ask our console to tell us what the heck is this file. And it'll tell us it's zlib compressed data. OK, that's a good starting point. So what if we cat out this file and we try to uncompress it? OK, that's kind of interesting. You can see the commit, the author, the message. Let's see if we do this over every file in this directory. So we'll just find every file and get objects. And we'll echo the file name. And we'll just cat out the file like that. And we have to, oh, fine. Do you really need to do that to me while I'm live coding? There we go. So those are, those are all the files that we have. And you can see some of them we can kind of understand what's going on. Some of them we can't. Actually, we have to zlib flake them first. OK, some of them we can kind of see what's going on. Some of them we can't. So let's do this. Let's put in the, we have the file name there. We'll put a, a space between them. And we'll see if we can kind of figure out what's going on here. We had three files here. One of them says blob0 in it. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be nice to you. 
And I'm going to see if I can make this screen a little bit easier to read on the side. So we'll just do this. And you're going to tell me, is that better for you or not? There we go. You should have complained earlier. I blame you. You can't blame me for this. OK, there we go. So we can see what we have here is um, a couple of different files. Now, if we pass these to you know, a program called XXD that will show us the actual binary that's in these files, we can see, well, there's this one thing called blob, there's this one thing called tree, and there's this one thing called commit. Now, the question we have is, what's up with these file names? Well, an interesting thing that we might figure out is if we take the contents of one of these files, and let's do this one here, and we, zil we zlibflate it, so we uncompress it, and we get the contents of it, and we pass it to SHA1SUM, we'll see that the name of the file is just the hash of the contents of the file. And so with that, we have pretty much enough to actually start writing a Git client. So let's take a look at what we're going to write. So here, we have the beginning of the application we're going to write. I put in a little bit of code here because I didn't really want to write this from scratch. The two parts that we're going to start with are a repo directory and an objects directory. Those are the two places we saw. And we have a little bit of command line parsing here. We're going to have a, a command that does the init, the add, and the commit all at once. Because to separate them is going to be a lot more work than we can do in the remaining 19 minutes that we have. Uh, we're going to allow them to pass in a couple of arguments like the author, the email, the message, the parent commit name, the timestamp. It's not going to be a fully fledged Git client. Well, from what we've seen, we already know enough to get started with this. We know that we need certain parts of the Python standard library. We need SHA-1, because we need to compute SHA-1 sums. We need to be able to create directories, because we need to create where this thing is. And we need to be able to compress things. Okay. And so we'll use the mix-in pattern. Turns out it's a pretty decent pattern to use here. And we'll say that there are a couple of Git objects that exist. And since we don't have much time, we can't even write the def on a separate line. We'll just do everything in one line like this. So SHA-1 bytes of s dot hex digest. So we know we have to compute the hex digest of these things. We know we need to compute the digest of these things as well. We know we probably want to compute what the path of these things is. So we, take, we create a path object. We take the hex digest. We saw that the path was everything. The, the directory was the first two characters in the SHA-1, and the path is the rest of that. So that's not too hard. right? And we know these things have, if we look closely at these things, we can see there's a little bit of header information. Like here it says tree. Here it says commit. We don't really know what those things are. Here it says blob. So we know there's some header information that's involved as well. Whoops. And what we'll do is we'll just say it's the type of object that we have, lowercase. And if we look closely, we can see what comes right after the header. Here it says 34. Here it says 193. And here it says. Zero. Well, you can kind of guess what that is because you know what that blob file is, the raw data for the readme. It's empty. That zero is probably the size of the thing itself. And you can see this is 193. Well, that looks kind of like 193 bytes. It's 34. It looks like 34 bytes. So the last piece that we need here is just the length of the body, the length of the thing that's contained in the file. Now, if we have the body, we, you know, we'll just have an empty string as a default body. And then the other two operations we need to do is we need to take these objects and convert them into byte strings, which is just the header plus the body. And we need to be able to write this to disk. So the path is just the objects directory with the path. And we'll just make all the directories that we need. And if those directories already exist, that's no big deal. And then we'll just open the file for writing as a binary file, and we'll just write it out compressed. So what we know here is that a git directory is just a bunch of files sitting in a directory called objects that are compressed, where the file name is a hash of the contents of the file. Now, something interesting happens there when we think about that being the hash of the contents of the file. What that means is if the contents of that file changed, the hash would change and the path would change. Well, that's going to lead to an inconsistency because we're going to expect the file to be in one place, but it's not going to be there. So what that tells us is this is an immutable store. Once you write something to the git object store, it never changes. Every time you add something to the store, it never changes. Because if it changed, then the path name would change. And you'd, run up, you'd end up with this inconsistency where the contents and the path name don't line up. So let's think about, so what we could do with that is we could probably use name tuple to model these objects. We don't even need Python 3.7. We don't even need data classes here. Isn't that, isn't that great? And so we know we have this first type of object, which is just the blob. 
And what I told you was the blob is just how Git stores its raw data. One thing that people oftentimes, who, especially people who come from other uh, version control systems, uh, might often incorrectly assume is that Git stores diffs. It does not store diffs. When you add a file to a Git repository, it always stores the file whole. And so if you add a file to a Git repository three times, the hash will be the same because the contents are the same. So it won't duplicate that. It'll, all, it'll just notice that it already stored it. But if you make a one line change, you'll have three copies with the entire copy of that file with that one line change, not just the diffs. There's another mechanism that we definitely don't have time to get into, pack files that help you actually make this efficient with some deduplication process. But fundamentally, Git stores the entire file and then computes the diffs live. And the reason, if you go back historically, is that Linus said, well, the diff algorithm might change over time, so we don't want to hard code that into Git. Now, once you have a bunch of files, you put them into a tree. And a tree is the second type of object here. And you can see it is what looks like permissions, what looks like the file name, and then a bunch of junk at the end. Well, if we look at this junk at the end here, like all this junk we can't figure out, if we look at that, we'll see E698. That looks oddly familiar. In fact, that's the name of one of, the, uh, one of the hashes of one of the objects that we have. So we know that the other fundamental object that's stored in Git is a tree object. And a tree object is just some object that contains a text file that contains a listing of all the files that belong to that tree. One thing that you've all probably tried at some point is created an empty Git directory. You created an empty directory in that Git directory. You tried to add the directory and commit, and it said, you, I can't commit an empty directory. Why? Directories are not stored in Git. Git stores the raw file contents, and then it stores these tree objects that tell you how those things are aligned on disk. If there's a subdirectory, it's a tree object that happens to contain another tree object. So let's write our tree object. Well, the body of this tree object is pretty simple. It's just every entry in its listing. And for the last part of this, if we ever get to the end of this, we will actually need to be able to mutate this. So we're going to kind of make this one mutable just to make our final example easy. Now, now we have the ability to store raw data in Git, the ability to organize that into files. The last thing that we're missing in Git is commits. Well, in Git, commits are pretty simple. That was the first object I looked at. And you could see it just looked like a text object. It's just a text file that's zipped that says the name of the commit, the name of the author, and what the tree that points to that commit is, and what the parent of that commit is. So a commit object in Git is also quite simple. Now, we're going to use stat from the OS module um, to make this a little easier. So actually, no, before we do that, for the tree, we want to create some node. Uh, no, we'll just do this. We'll, uh, we'll do the commit object next, and then we'll change the order. Why not? Why not, why not break away from what we had planned to talk about and talk about something totally different? If we're live coding, we might as well just go wild and do everything live. OK, so a commit object is just some tree, some author, some message, and some parent commit. So all Git tracks for a, par for a commit, for a history of a file, is one commit, what the previous commit was, what the previous commit was, what the previous commit was. For each commit, it tracks a tree. Each tree just says this specific file. And then behind the scenes, there's some magic with pack files and things like that to make it efficient. The commit object is very simple. And a commit doesn't necessarily have a parent. So we'll just use this little trick that we know from using name tuples for many years so that we can have a name tuple that has an unspecified commit. And the body for this is pretty simple. Um, the body of the commit object is just a couple of things joined together by new lines. The and we'll use, we need Python 3.6 because we want these f strings here. The tree name, uh, the parent name if it exists, and you're going to like this one here. Uh, we don't have time to you know, do the if else functionality. So I found this is maybe a little bit faster of a way for us to write the parent if the parent exists or not write the parent if the parent exists. Uh, what self dot? Uh, I don't want QA time, so we can take that in as well. How, how do you like that? the author, 
and the committer. And you can see very rarely in some of the projects you work on will the author be separate from the committer. But in large projects like the Linux kernel, it's often the case that the person who's committing the file and the person who wrote it may not be the same. And then the message. That's just the message for that. And we encode it. And that's a commit object. And that's pretty much all there is. Now, there's a couple other pieces that we need in order to make this work. And because we didn't have time to write all of that, I'll show you what those pieces are. I wrote them ahead of time. Um, one of the other pieces we need is for the author, we want to have the author with their name and their email and brackets. Well, this isn't very interesting technically, and maybe a timestamp, and you need to format the timestamp just right so everything looks similarly. So here we have just those that we wrote ahead of time, just some simple object that does the formatting for the author. Um, if we're going to be storing these modes, you can see the first part of the tree object here is this number 1,000 or 100,644. This is a Unix mode, so this means that the file doesn't have any of these special bits like set UID or a sticky bit set, and it's just 644, so that means that the author can read and write and the other users uh, have only read permission. Well, we might, might want a little bit of a helper for that, so we have this object called mode and oct, so we can, we can do this last part a little bit easier. And then the index, which we'll talk about at the end. So with these parts in place, we have more or less enough to store in the data store. The problem is, in a Git repository, there's also this thing called the index. And what the index contains is information about what you would commit. When you type git status, when you type git add, there's a temporary storage place where git tracks what would go into the next commit, and that's the index. If you look at the index, it is not a very theoretically interesting object. It's really just this binary file with a very set format, and you have to fill in the fields manually, like a 32-bit UID, 32-bit GID, and it's a real pain to write. And if we had 90 minutes, I could show you writing this from scratch. But instead, this is what it looks like. It's just a little bit of uh, bit packing for entries, and you can see you put in the, the, uh, the creation time, the modification time, the information about the file. That's what the git index looks like. So we're going to grab some of those things from our uh, utils file and we'll see if we can wrap this up. So I said from utils, import author, index, and entry. And from os.path, we'll just import is file and exists. And I'll show you how we can do this last part of our task. We're given a repository that we're going to create, add a bunch of files, commit, and that's the end of it. And so we're given some paths. And we'll just go for each path that exists if it's a file. Because we know we don't want to try and commit a, a directory. That doesn't make sense in Git. Git doesn't store directories. It only store files. We're going to create blobs and nodes for each one of these objects. Now, the node object is also in our utils file. It's just an object that represents a file on disk where it automatically figures out what the permissions are. It's just a little helper to make this next part easy enough. But the core objects that we're interacting with are just commits, trees, and blobs. So what we'll do is we'll say for each path that we have, We'll open the, the object for reading in binary mode. We'll construct a blob by reading the whole thing in. We'll create a node object just representing, a, representing this thing that sits on disk. And behind the scenes, this will automatically figure out what the permissions are. We'll create an entry in our index. We'll keep track of this blob. We'll keep track of this node in a dictionary, and we'll keep track of the entries that we have. Then we'll construct the trees. Remember, trees can contain other trees. So if you have a very deeply nested directory, it's just a tree object that contains another tree object that contains another tree object, where at the end of it, it's just a blob object representing raw files. So we'll just, do, we'll just create the trees like this. And then for each path, we'll just add. And this is why we made this tree object mutable. the node there. So we now have constructed all the trees. And then for pt and trees.items, if p equals p.parent. So if it's at the top, we won't, we won't worry about it. Otherwise, and we don't even have time to write this on two lines, we'll create a node for this thing, for this tree object, because we just created the tree objects because we have to write that. And then we'll insert that as well. And then the last part in order to make this work is we'll write each blob to disk. 
we'll write each tree to disk. We'll create an author, another helper object for ourselves. We'll create a commit object using our topmost tree. And we'll capture the hex digest of that author, args.message, args.parent. And we'll write our commit object to disk. Then the last thing is we have to create our index. So we just create our index with our entries. And we don't really need this for the core functionality of Git. We just need it so the Git status shows us something right. And we'll do the last two files I told you about, head and ref. If you look at those two files, so if we look at cat git head, it's just a text file that points to a directory, refs heads master. If we look at git refs heads master, this is just a text file that contains the hash to where the commit object at the very top is, the latest commit object is. So in our utils, we just have a very simple function called create head. All it does is creates a file called head that contains ref heads master and create a file called ref, just creates a file with that name with the hex digest of the commit that we're doing. It's the only piece we need left to make this whole thing work. Uh, so we'll just call create head, repo dir, create ref with the commit. And at the very top, we'll just make sure we use all of our utils. We'll just import all of those. And we don't have time to import them individually. This is the only time you're allowed to import star if you have two <laughs> minutes left in a live coding talk. OK, so there we go. Let's write this to disk. Let's write that to disk. And here's our demo. Here's our directory with the two things that we wrote. It's in git pi. And just to show, there's nothing magic here. There's no uh, git directory here. right? So let's see if this works. Git pi. Uh, let's find lamb, lamb. There we go, lambda. Let's see if there's anything else here that we misspelled. Um, I think you also put author instead of a at one point. OK, we'll fix that. <coughs> author here. Oh, thank you. Any, any, any other things that you caught? Dunder new is not a class method. Uh, no, that actually works. That's how it works. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh, he was, he was aiming for the last one. He didn't get it. So let's see if it works. OK, git pi star. Uh-oh, date util. Uh-oh, we forgot to install this. sudo apt install python. <laughs> date util. We, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have tested this on a brand new VM. That's the problem. Let's see if this works. Oh, come on, apt. I'm glad I, 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 OK, let's see if that worked. No, oh, no module. Uh, Python 3 date util, probably. Oh, come on, Ubuntu. <laughs> come on. <laughs> OK, one more time, one more time. Let's see. Uh, TZ local. Oh, boy, this is a real pain in the butt. We should have made sure that we had a requirements.txt before we started with this thing. Let's see if that's the end of it. Yeah, we should, we should use two things out of the, oh, there we go. Get status. On branch master, nothing to commit, working to clean. First commit. There we go. So there you go. Let's wrap up. What do we see? Well, we didn't know how the index worked. That's another thing that's worth looking into. This is not a particularly efficient Git client because it doesn't use pack files and it won't be able to interact with the real Git directory, which uses some of that functionality. So there's definitely something that you need to research into pack files. But fundamentally, the core data model of Git is what? A directory that sits on disk, that has file contents that are immutable, that never change. Those file contents, the file path for that is just the hash of what the contents are. Each file is either a text file or a binary file that has what type of file it is, a blob or a commit or a tree, or we didn't look at a ref, the size of it, and then some contents, and that's it. And everything else is just manipulating those files on disk. So you can think, how does git pull and git push work? Well, git pull just says, what immutable files do you have that I don't have? Let me grab them. Git push says, what files don't you have that I have? Push them. Some of you have run into detached head mode. Well, detached head mode is a git repository cannot figure out where it is outside of that file called ref pointing to the top. So if you ever lose track of what commit you're on, the repository doesn't have the commit separate. They're just these opaque objects. So the, the repository can sometimes get confused as to where 
the latest commit in the tree is. Another thing you can see is a Git repository does not have to contain one contiguous uh, workflow. You can have a Git repository that actually contains multiple projects that are completely independent of each other. Um, and so if you ever use GitHub pages, one thing that you could do with GitHub pages is you could have the, Git, the GitHub pages tree and and the branch for, we were so excited we dropped the mic, and, and the branch for the actual code that could be completely separate. The other thing you can see is you can just throw things into a Git repository that as long as they don't get accidentally garbage collected, you can throw a bunch of stuff into a Git repository that aren't part of a code tree, like credentials or readme or documentation or something else like that. So hopefully this has gotten you thinking about how Git works internally. Hopefully some of you might be able to reproduce this work. Um, and maybe extend it further and get a better understanding of how Git works fundamentally. Thank you so much.